Good morning, Hope Church. Thanks for gathering with us online for our continuing through the Book of Lamentations, a series we've called From the Depths. We're in chapter 3 today, which, which has already been read for you, or at least a section of it. So I'm going to pray as we jump into God's Word together. Father, thank you for the truth of your Word and the way that you, you minister to us. Thank you for, for the, the fact that e whether it's in person or, or even through this technology and this medium that your word ministers to us. So I pray that your people gathered with their families or even alone in their, in their homes or however they're listening to this message on a Sunday or thereafter, that you would minister your word to them. Father, thank you for the truth of the gospel. Thank you that Jesus Christ entered into our situation, not, not only in regard to the greatness of our salvation, but even as we deal with the difficulties in this life, about which, Father, as we talk about lament, we address today. So thank you for your goodness. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I, want, I want to just start with, a, with a, a brief overview just to give you a picture, in, in part because it's been interesting to hear from several of you regarding the fact that you haven't heard much about lamentations over your time in your Christian life. We, even, even many of you who've been Christians for a long time would say that lamentations has not been a book you spend a lot of time in. And when we believe, as we do as Christians, that we should we should read and know and study the whole counsel of God's Word, that Lamentations is included in that, alongside any other great book that we might know well or have spent a good amount of time in. Lamentations is also equally part of God's Word. I've defined lament as something like this, hopeful groaning, or I, even, even this week I was wondering if it'd be better to say hopeful grieving, meaning it's this process of dealing with our brokenness and our broken condition. And I want to just summarize what we've learned from the first two chapters of Lamentations before we jump into chapter three. In Lamentations chapter one, we learned this. So hear this, because I think this is really helpful for us, that there are three ways that we normally respond to suffering and pain. Fear, anger and despair. Those are the three go-tos. Those are, those are kind of the MOs for most of us when we, wanna, when we face suffering or pain or difficulty or just the brokenness of our sinful and fallen world, whether it's, whether it's a calamity that happens to us, whether it's financial, emotional, uh, whether it's economic, whatever it is, even our own bodies, usually we respond in fear or anger or despair. The book of Lamentations is offering a fourth biblical option called lament. Lament is this fourth option. It's not, not in any way denying the fact that there is something to be fearful about or something that would cause us to get angry or something that would lead us to despair. Or somebody said to me this week, maybe even the better word would be depression, right? Fair enough. Like those are, those are ways that our body and our emotions want to respond to crises. But the Bible, not just in Lamentations, but, but in over half the Psalms or even in the ministry of Jesus, gives us a fourth and call it biblical option of lament, which again, briefly summarizing in two words, is hopeful grieving. That's what we learned as we looked at chapter one in Lamentations. Chapter two gave us that first step because we, we asked the question, okay, great, uh, Thanks for the easy definition, hopeful grieving, and agreed. I'd like a fourth option rather than, than fear, anger, and despair. But, but what does that look like? In chapter 2 of Lamentations gave us the first step. The first step is, is simply turning toward God. Like, it's just acknowledging him. It's, it's including him in the picture. I think that we saw that as we looked uh, at Lamentations, the difference between Lamentations chapter 1 and Lamentations chapter 2. In chapter 1, you had this objective observer just simply looking at the destruction of his city, Jerusalem, and describing it as if he's giving a newscast. And at one point, the city of Jerusalem, described as a weeping woman, or so Jerusalem personified, breaks into his newscast and begins to speak, not in the third person, but in the first person. Whoa, Lord, hear, hear my cry. Like it's teaching us how to enter in, how to understand that lament has both an inside and an outside perspective. But by chapter two, there was a difference. The author brings in God. God is immediately included in the conversation. The author begins to share in the pain of what he's observing in the city of 
of Jerusalem. And even at one point calls out to the weeping woman. Again, this city of Jerusalem personified to cry out and speak. So there we learned the first step. The first step of hopeful grieving, the first step of lament, is including God in the equation. It's it's bringing him in and asking him questions. Now we get to Lamentations chapter 3. And if I were just going to give you a brief orientation, I, I, would, I would tell you this. This is the pinnacle of the book. It, the book of Lamentations has five chapters, right? So, and, and in the middle of them, almost like a peak of a mountain, is this third chapter. And it's climactic not only in the way it addresses the topic and deals with the, the lamentation of the city of Jerusalem, but there's even like a poetic descriptive way it does this. If you were just going to flip through the pages of your, of your copy of Lamentations, you'll notice that chapter 1 has 22 verses, chapter 2 has 22 verses, chapter 4 has 22 verses, and chapter 5 has 22 verses. And each of those verses begin with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, meaning what, what, what the book is doing in all four of those chapters, 1 and 2, 4 and 5, is working through the Hebrew alphabet from call it A to Z, so that you can be communicated to with a structure that does a couple things. Number one, as we talked about our very first week of this series, Lamentations is trying to teach us that God is not afraid to have us deal with the fullness of our grief and brokenness. And by literally going through the Hebrew alphabet in every single chapter, it is wanting to communicate that. But the other advantage or or the teaching point of going through the alphabet in each of these chapters is this, our grief will have an end. It is not eternal. It has a beginning and it has an end because God is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He holds the whole world in his hands. It's teaching us to deal with the fullness of grief and yet to know that grief will one day, whatever it looks like, one day will have an end. Now you ask the question, how many verses are there in chapter 3? Well, the answer is 66. Think about that. Not 22 but 66, three times the number of verses. And why is that? Because in this chapter, every Hebrew letter is tripled. It's, it's, it's three in a row. So three A's to use English letters, three B's, three C's, three D's. Why does it do that? That's a sign of Memphis. Maybe you're familiar with either from the song or just simply from Isaiah 6 itself, where the, where the angels cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You will find that in Scripture, three is this emphatic number. It, it, in a sense, three is like circling or, or underlining or putting in italics or an exclamation point to make a strong emphasis in God's Word. So by this middle chapter, having 66 verses, it's this peak, it's this pinnacle through which or from which we're supposed to look at our suffering in the world. So let's, let's, let's jump into Lamentations chapter 3 this morning. There's, there's way too many verses that we can look at in detail. So I, I picked out two things that I want you to notice that I'm going I'm to talk us through as we look at this text today. The, the, the first is this, and it's coming from the first 18 verses. Following the example of Christ, the Christian learns to join others in their suffering. Now, when you remember the the account I just gave you about the author, which we believe is Jeremiah, right? Who had just prophesied for 40 years. Picture your whole career telling the people to repent and return to God, their Lord, and to see them not do that. You can imagine as he's standing on the outside of the city looking in, there's there's a disengagement he initially feels as he feels like these people aren't even his own people anymore. They've rejected the God that he'd been called to command them to return to. But as you watch in chapters 1 and then in 2, you see a change. He enters in more and more, so much so that by, as we said a few minutes ago in chapter 2, he was claiming it as his own grief and suffering. He was trying to engage with the people with whom he was ministering. Now look at chapter 3. And if you have your Bibles, or I hope they do, or even on your phone, Look with me at the first few verses. I'm just going to look at the first few. On my ESV, the pagination says it's on page 688, Lamentations 3. Listen to the language starting in verse 1. The author says this, I am the man who has seen affliction. 
under the rod of his wrath. Now note this, verse two. He, referring to God, now God's already been included in this. He is driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Notice how that move in verse one to verse two is no longer describing what's happening to others, but now he's incorporated. In fact, it almost is the language of God has brought him into it. God has brought him, driven him into the darkness. It's so much so that by the time you get to verse three, the author is saying something like this, surely against me he turns his hand. The man, even though he was protesting the sin that led to this judgment of God, the author is now claiming it is his own. God has turned his hand against him. Look at verse four. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness. Look at how much of a move from outside perspective to inside the author moves. The author of Lamentations has totally entered in. He has embodied, literally embodied the suffering of this people. They are no longer just his people or those people. It is no longer just that city. It is now something he's claiming as his own. That is exactly what Jesus Christ did. That that is exactly what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ could have sat back objectively and looked at our plight and said, "I, I created you perfectly. You were very good. I gave you all that you needed. You claimed more than you deserved and were, were owed. Why should I enter into you now? Why, why should I care at all about that? But that's not what Jesus did. He entered in. Like the ministry of Christ, the author of Lamentation enters into the situation and receives it at his own, as his own. Again, the language in, in verses one through six is stark. He has brought me into darkness. That is such strong language. Brothers and sisters, that's the example of the author of Lamentations. That is the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that should be the model for the Christian, that we should learn to join others in their suffering, to to, to mourn with those who mourn and to weep with those who weep, and to claim them as our own. This should, at the first level, begin with those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They are our people. They are our siblings in Christ. And all of you, Lord willing, feel this with your own immediate biological family. When, When one of them is struggling, you feel this loss. As a parent, for example, how easy is it for you to have empathy for your children when they are broken or burdened, no matter what their age. You feel the loss. It it hurts as if it was you that was facing it specifically. So the Christian must learn to enter in, to suffer with people. In the church, for sure, and even as we extend, like Christ himself, the love and the ministry of the gospel to people outside the walls of our church and our Christian homes, we should enter into the situation of suffering in the world and like Christ, be a light and to be salt in the world and the earth. I remember it was, I had just started working here at Hope Church coming on six years ago now. And it was just the first few months, I think it may have been my second, maybe third month, when a brother in our church up at a business trip up in Wisconsin had a stroke, uh, was found laying helpless halfway outside his hotel room on a business trip, was flown back by helicopter uh, to the Rockford area. I, I believe he was at OSF. And, and we... we got the call as a church, and I went, and I I literally had only spent maybe 10 minutes speaking with this man and his wife, 
up until this moment. I'm, I'm still new at the church. I'm learning names of, of people. I hadn't been here 10 years. I, didn't, I hadn't been in their home or, or they in mine at this point in our relationship. It was a new relationship. And I, and I get to this small waiting room, and there's a couple other friends and the people from our congregation there ministering around this sweet woman whose husband is down the hall in, in a vegetative state just days before he would pass away. And, I'm, and I walk in, and as, as I'm, I'm new, as, as even in this full-time pastoral role, I feel the weight of this moment, and even wanting to offer pastoral love and care, but, but not knowing how to even enter into the situation. And at one point, I'm, I'm sitting there with this sweet wife, and her friends had left, and we're in this small, totally uncomfortable waiting room uh, as we're waiting to go and see her husband. And she's talking to me about the fears that she has, how she didn't expect to be a widow at the age she was at, and, and, and what about her kids, and what about her life, and, and what about finances? And she's listing all these things she's grieving. She's grieving in this small waiting room at OSF on, on one of the floors, and I'm sitting there across from her with tears in my eyes, and I'm even wrestling with, 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 with all the emotions as I'm trying to resonate, connect, to understand, to just cry with her. And I really never said any grand words. There were no words to say. All I did was cry with her, and I prayed with her, and I walked in to the room to see her husband. We sat there, and, and I prayed over him, and I grabbed and held his hand, and I asked the Father to minister in this moment. That's, I entered in. I didn't know exactly even how to do it. In fact, I walked away from that hospital room wanting to have done more, but I just tried to enter in. I just tried to minister to a sister in Christ, and I just cried a lot. I prayed a lot. I just sat with her a lot. Sometimes that's all we can do. And then that's, that's all the author of Lamentations is doing. He feels what they feel. He calls out to God on their behalf. He weeps as they weep. And he prays for them, just as they, even in their weakness, may not be able to pray on their own. Brothers and sisters, follow the example of Christ and learn how to join in the suffering of others. This should be, even though it's hard, even as I, as here I was a pastor, even though I struggled with that, knowing exactly what to say, or how long to stay, or, or, or how to, to, to be comfortingly present with people with whom I didn't know that well yet. This must be something that we, as individual Christians, and as a corporate collective church, try to do. Even as we now collectively mourn with our community or our nation in the midst of the crisis we're facing right now. The last thing I want to say to you this morning, and, and, and maybe this is, the, this is the thrust of what Lamentations is trying to talk about, and I'll give you the summary, and then we'll jump into it. This chapter, Lamentations 3, teaches us that there is hope in God at the center of our suffering. Let me say that again. This chapter teaches us that there is hope in God at the center of our suffering. Now, you remember I've talked about the five chapters of Lamentations. Remember, 22 verses in chapters 1 and 5, 22 verses in chapters the two and four, and then the 66 verses in chapter three. And in the middle of those 66 verses, you get a section, verses 22 through 33. That is the, that is the pinnacle. It is, it is the center section. And in the entire book, it's the only place where hope is ever addressed. It's almost like if you're looking at Lamentations and it's a mountain, these verses, chapter 3, verses 22 through 33, that's the peak of the mountain. That's that beautiful, snow-covered peak of the mountain that we are seeing from the valley. You cannot get to, please hear this, you cannot get to verses 22 to 33 without passing through suffering. And you can't get the back door either. The, the front door, chapter 1 through the middle of chapter 3, and the back door, chapter, chapter 5 through the middle of chapter 3, have suffering on both sides. The hope is surrounded, literally physically, by the verses of the book. 
Hope is surrounded by suffering. But in the middle of this suffering, there is hope. So so don't think that the, don't, don't jump to the theme of the book in these verses and lose their context. Don't you dare jump to Lamentations chapter three, verses 22 to 33, and think you can skip over the suffering. Don't do that. These few verses are surrounded with real horrific suffering. It is hope in the midst of suffering, not hope in spite of it. It isn't just some kind of comfortable backyard lawn chair kind of Bible verse that I just want to read to pleasure me in God's goodness when all things are going well. It is a glimmer of light in a pit of darkness. That's the only context in which these verses are to be read. I say that because we need to make sure that Laments hope does not drown out the cries of suffering. Rather, it reaches toward hope on a long road of pain and anguish. Too many Christians only know these verses and lamentations because of the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I read those lyrics again even this week, and it's a wonderful, wonderful song. But that song is best sung with these verses when we are in tears, when we are broken. These verses are surrounded with suffering, not only the suffering in Lamentations 3, but now you add the context of the whole book, and you've got two chapters on each end that surround it this way. Such songs in our Western, comfortable world loses what Lamentations is trying to teach us. I want you to hear these verses in the context of suffering. These verses are sung from the corners of Auschwitz. They're sung in the depths of depression. They're sung in oncology wards in hospitals. They are not just sung with full bellies on Thanksgiving Day. Listen to the words Lamentations 3 says in some of these verses. Verse 22 After two and a half chapters of intense suffering and anguish, the text says this, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. That that word translated steadfast love in Hebrew is chesed. You almost almost have to spit to say it, but there's that word. it's It's the strongest, most covenantal love word in the Bible. It's a word that says God has committed to you and he will not fail. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. There it is. Notice there's no talk of resolution. There's no talk of it'll be over in a couple weeks or in a couple hours or everything's going to be fixed. You don't hear that. What you hear is God is your hope. And the soul, not even just my mouth, not even just my emotions, the soul, verse 24 says, right? The core of of our being has to cry out this word. Lord, you are my portion and I will put my hope in you. See, in the context of Lamentations, these rich words tell us what we're trying to qualify this morning. Number one is that laments hope doesn't drown out the cries of suffering. But also, we cannot deny these verses. We cannot say there is no hope and simply blame God and accuse him of either impotence or injustice. Neither of those are true. Neither of those are right. Lamentations teaches us, even allows us to hold on to both. The horror of suffering, which must be not only fully expressed, but remembered, but also the abiding faithfulness and goodness of God. That's what Lamentations is teaching us. There's lament. There it is. There's that grieving that has hope. It doesn't say grieving that necessarily has hope a clear resolution. It's hopeful grieving. What's important not to miss is is a few verses after this announcement of hope. 
and the promise of hope, and, and, and further in the midst of suffering, there is one little spot in Lamentations where God speaks. In fact, if, if you weren't careful, you might miss it. It's the only place. God, God in, in, in general, is silent, the whole book of Lamentations, until you get, starting in verse 55, read with me, I'll read it out loud. I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit, that's the, the phrase I used to title this series, from the depths of the pit, you heard my plea, do not close your ear to my cry for help. The author cries out. Then look at verse 57. Here it is. Circle it, underline it, whatever you do. The text says, you came near when I called on you and you said, do not fear. There it is. That's the only thing God speaks. That's, that's it. In the, in the Hebrew, it's two words. That's it. In English, it's our three. That's all he says. Fear not. Don't fear doesn't give any resolution, doesn't explain how it will be all worked out. He gives nothing. He gives his voice. He gives his word. He just simply says, do not fear. God is present with us in the midst of our suffering. He is present. Maybe we're getting to that second step of lament. Remember, lament is hopeful grieving, and, and, and the, the first thing we learned is, is that it's, it's the biblical or best response to suffering, not, not fear, anger, despair, but lament. The first step of lament is simply acknowledging God, turning toward God, including him in our crisis. And here's the second step. The second, second step of lament is trusting God's character and embracing his mercy, reaching for it, and hoping with God, hoping in God, no matter what resolution he may bring, no matter how long it may take, it's hoping in God. Friends of ours, we've known for years, my close friend Chad uh, died of cancer. I've shared this story with our church family before, but I actually learned new information even this past week. My friend Chad died of cancer at the age of 29. He was a couple years ahead of me. I was 27 when he passed away. So this is coming on now, uh, 20 years ago, he was, when he passed away, his wife was nine months pregnant with their fourth child. In fact, I, I've shared before the, the funeral service that I, we were in the UK, Laura and I were, and so we, we got a VHS tape of the, of the ceremony, the service, because we couldn't be there, of this ending of the, of the service with this, this pregnant woman weeping and worshiping simultaneously. And I just remember I was bawling like a baby in the middle of St. Andrews, Scotland, as I'm watching this VHS tape of this funeral that had happened a month previous, as I watched with a casket, and here's death standing in front of her. Here's life in her growing womb, and there is lament within the midst of worship, a, a closing song of the funeral, and she is praising and crying at the same time. What I didn't know is when they were having their doctor's appointments, some of which Chad could go to, even though he was at the end of his, of his life and his strength, at one point they did a scan to find out the gender of the baby. And they, weren't, they were undecided what they, if they were going to find it out or not, if they were going to find out if it was a boy or girl. And so Chad suggested to the to the technician, why don't you write it down, put it in a piece of paper and fold it up. So the, the technician wrote down, boy, boy and girl, I think Chad had written boy, girl on the paper. She took it, circled one, folded it, gave it to them, and they never looked at it. In fact, uh, what Jessica did before they closed the casket is she put that little piece of paper inside her husband's hand without having looked at it herself. And you know why she did that? Because she knew that death was temporary. She knew in the midst of suffering, I'm talking about suffering, this woman with a baby in her room and three other little children behind her slips this little piece of paper, the announcement of the gender of their fourth child inside the hand of her husband who was about to be buried in the ground. And one month later, less than a month, three weeks later, after that funeral, a little baby boy was born who looks a lot like his dad. See, she knew that even in the midst, in the center 
of horrific suffering and loss without a resolution. This was no resurrection of Lazarus. Chad is still buried waiting for the, for the great resurrection that our Lord will provide. She knew in the midst of the darkness that there was hope. That's lament. It's a hopeful grieving. And that second step of lament is trusting in God's character. It's embracing his mercy and it's reaching out and placing our faith and our hope in his person. Not on the results, not on the circumstances, in the person of God. Remember the text uh, or the, the comment I shared with you last week that, that I found helpful? God has broad enough shoulders to cry on and a big enough chest to beat against, even at a funeral. Brothers and sisters, this is our hope, not, not without suffering, not, not on bright, sunny days, but rather than responding with fear or with anger or despair, we, we, we lift up toward God. We begin to embrace and trust his character and to trust his mercy because he is the only one to whom we can turn. And in the midst of our suffering, not in spite, in the midst of it, we cry out, hopeful, grieving to our Lord. And this is what, in the darkness, in the pain, this is what we say. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are a God of hope and light in the midst of darkness. I ask that you would help us as we are apprentices of lament, as our church is going through your word of lamentations. Help us to learn how you are present with us in our suffering. Help us to trust in you as our source of hope, even when, Father, even when we don't yet fully see the light, we trust in the Lord. Help our souls to cry out to you. May you be our portion. Thank you that you are the God of morning mercies. We pray this. In Jesus' name, amen.